The thing I hate to hear about the most is when someone gets involved with a bad franchise. Now, even though franchising is the most proven business model in history, and there are over 4,000 different franchise brands and over 800,000 franchise businesses that are owned by people like you and me, the reality is there are bad franchises out there that I would personally stay away from. So in this video, let's talk about what franchises are the worst. So the first are dying brands, whether it's from poor decisions from executives or just a brand that is dying due to new trends or people getting tired of them. This is something to watch out for. Brands like Quiznos, Blockbusters, Dippin' Dots, and Chuck E. Cheese are dead. Sure, at one point, these were all household names that seemingly would have been a smart move. But with some of the other points we'll mention in this video to stay away from, you'll be able to make sure to protect yourself from doing something you might regret. Now, Subway is another brand that's closed 2,000 store locations since 2021, which represented 10% of their locations open in the United States. And I'd argue for every one that closed, there's probably three more stores that are barely treading water. Number two is food franchises. Now, there's so much irony in the fact that I'm saying food franchises because I literally owned food franchises. And if it wasn't for food franchises, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be making these videos. And look, I'm grateful to my franchisor because quite honestly, they were incredibly supportive, helpful, and just really great people overall. So why would I say that a food franchise is one of the worst franchises to buy? I have a few reasons, but look, everything that I share with you is from my own experience. The reality is that doesn't make me right or you wrong. I personally know people that have made a lot of money owning food franchises. Like my friend Peter, who has over 47 Dunkin' Donuts over his business career. I actually did a podcast episode with him and you can hear all about how he grew his franchise empire. But the reality is for most is that owning food franchises is not only incredibly competitive, but insanely expensive. And you really need at least three locations to make it worth it my opinion. Now, a huge thing about food businesses is that it's known to have very low profit margins. According to Restaurant 365, the average quick service restaurant, also known as QSR, makes six to nine percent profit margins. So at one million dollars in sales, we're talking 60 to 90 thousand dollars in profit. And to build it out is usually quite expensive. My first store cost over three hundred thousand dollars to get open. In our first year, we did about four hundred seventy thousand dollars in sales, which was only a one point five sales to investment ratio, which ideally you want to see a two to one in a retail based franchise. I didn't know that at the time. And to be fair, by year three, the store was doing $750,000 a year in sales. But what I didn't know is that there are service based franchises that are half the price to get open and show similar sales numbers. I recently put together a 17 page PDF breakdown of five low cost franchises that all make $1 million or more a year in sales. If you want access to it, you can go grab it for free at franchiseempire.com forward slash low cost. The link is also down below. Now, the other thing that makes it tough is that it takes about a year to get open after you sign your franchise agreement. You've got to find a location, negotiate a lease, get permits, do your build out. It's a long process. Another point is that food is super competitive. These days, there's so many options. To stand out is really hard. Then if you take any of the big name food franchises, there's pretty much no territory available ability for outsiders just coming into the brand like you and me. You have so many huge private equity companies or big investment groups that own 5, 10, 20, 50 locations of various big name food brands. Then you have the fact that restaurants have incredibly high turnover. So you constantly have to be hiring and training and hiring and training. And at the same time, managing your labor cost to then spit out six to 9% profit margins, which is very difficult. Number three is a franchise with less than five franchisees. Look, over the years, I've spoken to hundreds of potential franchise buyers. And the number one thing that drives me crazy when someone tells me how excited excited they are about becoming the first franchisee of a brand. In general, that is a terrible idea. Think about it. What's the entire point of a franchise? Like, why would you buy a franchise as opposed to start a business on your own? Because there's a proven model and system. That's the benefit. If you are the first, 
or second or third franchisee, guess what? The model isn't proven. They're still figuring that out. Just because someone opens a business and they see success with that business doesn't mean it will succeed as a franchise. And just because they did well operating that business doesn't mean they'll do well operating a franchise system, supporting franchisees. Not all businesses are duplicatable and building the skill set to help other people open that business is a totally different skill set than actually operating the business that was started. And nine times out of 10, there's not a proven system yet. There are no SOPs or operation manuals. There's no brand standards or sales and marketing blueprints. And most of the time, there's a similar franchise that does have a track record with dozens, if not hundreds of franchise owners. So why in the world would you choose something that's unproven versus something that's proven. It's just stupid and irresponsible, really. Plus, most new franchisors are severely undercapitalized and understaffed. It's not all of them, but most of them are. And the business owners who decide to franchise their business don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around. So how do they hire support staff to support the franchisee or a marketing department or an operations department? You get what I'm saying? They are usually bootstrapping it. And so that turns into poor support no proven system and a high likelihood that they could actually fail. So unless you feel comfortable with rolling the dice, I'd stay away. Number four is boutique fitness. This is like your Pilates and cycling studios and these specialty workouts. Look, I love fitness. Working out is one of my biggest passions and there's no better feeling than after a really good workout. I've looked into buying many gyms, but every time I just couldn't get comfortable enough to pull the trigger. Why? Well, with boutique fitness specifically, you were aiming at a high price Point. So $150 to $300 a month. And generally, you're offering a very limited workout in specific experience. So naturally, for people who want variety, they eventually get bored and cancel and then jump to the next cool workout or do something like I do, which is my local YMCA is giant and state of the art. Who would think? Like when you think of YMCA, you think of like an old place that's kind of run down. It's crazy, but it's state of the art. And they have really awesome workout classes, pretty much seven days a week, all day long. I think I pay $100 a month total for my entire family to get access. My wife, me, our kids, they have a, a like a childcare center that's open like 10 hours a day there, it's incredible. So even if I love cycling, why would I go pay $150 a month to only get access to just a cycling place when my gym has weights, basketball courts, swimming pools, cycling classes, and more? There's also some major controversy out there around the biggest fitness conglomerate in the franchise space and potentially misrepresenting financial performance. Look, I'm, I'm not in the business of making hit pieces, but if I decide to, they might be the first one. When franchise owners were about to close down, they would take over ownership of the studios and then try to resell them at a really discounted price. And then they would tout that they didn't have any locations that closed. If they weren't buying them back, they would have closed. Now they are being investigated by the SEC. So we'll see how that goes. Anyways, when you have five or six six boutique fitness concepts in like a one or two mile radius, I just personally think it's really difficult to sustainably keep three or 400 members paying and not realizing that they could either get better bang for their buck at their local gym that also offer cycling or they just get bored of it. The fitness and nutrition world are constantly changing. There's so many trends and I get nervous that some of these workouts are a trend. For example, we've had a handful of clients buy painting franchises. Painting isn't a trend. Until they figure out how to get robots to do it faster and cheaper, people will always need their homes painted and it's probably not going away. And what this all leads to in boutique fitness is a very high attrition rate, meaning if if you have 300 paying members, if you lose 10% of those a month, you're losing 30 members a month. And if you aren't also gaining 30 new members a month to replace them, guess what? Your sales are going down. The other point to this is that many of these are located in retail locations where you need what's called class A real estate, your typical nice shopping center. And the rent there is typically really high. And when you have high rent every single month, it makes it really hard to make money. Sure. 
Sounds obvious, but the difference between what it takes to make a profit at $10,000 a month in rent is vastly different than at $6,000 a month in rent. It's one of the reasons why service-based franchises are doing really well. You're not signing a 10-year lease for expensive class A real estate. If you haven't already, make sure to go to franchiseempire.com forward slash low cost so you can get that list of five low cost franchises, which are service brands that all make a million dollars or more. And we have access to a thousand franchise brands, by the way. Those are just five that we decided to do a case study on. Speaking of five, number five is brands with low average sales. So I remember seeing a brand that showed average sales of just over $400,000 for a retail based food franchise. So we're like, we're double striking there that cost up to $415,000 to get up and running. Now the math just doesn't make sense. And it's nearly impossible to make money at a one to one sales to investment ratio. But I've seen it time and time again, where people get so excited about a brand and the future and the fact that they're growing so fast, but the numbers just don't make sense. And most people don't understand that you need to have a certain level of average sales for the business to be viable. If you're doing retail, you need to see a two to one sales to investment ratio and three to one on service, meaning if it cost $400,000 for a retail franchise to get open, you at minimum need to see that the average sales is $800,000. Or what happens is you see exciting gross profit numbers, not realizing what the term gross profit means and that there are actually many expenses that occur after gross profit. Look, not to beat a dead horse here, but the entire point of a franchise is that it shows a proven track record of happy and profitable franchisees. If you can't verify that, then run. Number six is brands that don't show sales. Every franchise is regulated by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And because of that, they all have to create a franchise disclosure document. And in that document is where they can legally say, hey, here's how much money our franchisees are making. Now, there's no standard way to show sales and or profits in those documents, but at least there's franchises that show something. As an example, some just list sales by quartile, some show every single franchise location sales, some show profit and some don't, but the worst is when they decide to opt to put a disclaimer where they refuse to not show any past sales information. Think about it. You decide to franchise your business and you want people to invest their money into a business where people wanna know how much money can I make with this thing? And you decide to be like, no, we aren't gonna tell you how much other people are making. It comes off as if you're trying to hide something. And in my experience, that usually is the case. Meaning the numbers probably aren't very good. Franchisees aren't performing well. And because of that, you are opting to not show any numbers. And really at that point, you shouldn't be accepting any new franchisees. If your current franchisees are struggling, how in good conscience can you accept other people's money and have them sign a 10 year contract? Shame on you. Number seven, brands exploding with growth. People get really excited when a franchise is growing really fast. It triggers FOMO, right? The fear of missing out and causes people to stop using the logic and rely on their excitement. And excitement is a bad idea when it comes to investing. Sometimes it can work, I will admit that, but more often than not, it doesn't. And I've seen it time and time again of franchise brands that are bringing in hundreds of franchisees a year. And there just isn't enough data yet of proven and successful franchisees as they're growing. So people are buying based on hype and the success of one or two franchisees and the FDD. And that came in early on without people properly doing their due diligence. And many times these franchise brands aren't hiring the support staff that they need to support the franchisees quickly enough. Or at first it's a good idea, but then all these competitors come out copying them in their business model and the success early franchisees saw isn't the same that the future franchisees see because the early franchisees didn't have any competition and now there's three or four or five competitors for the franchisees that are joining now. At the end of the day, there's so many great franchises out there that are proven and owning a business is hard enough as it is. So don't make life harder on yourself than it needs to be by buying a dumb franchise. And in this video, I break down seven businesses that have incredible profit margins. It'll save you a ton of time on trying to find the good opportunities on your own. Make sure to like the video below, subscribe before you go, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.